Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, you know, I think on, on behalf of Coastal and behalf of our team, I can't tell you how excited and pleased we were to be able to win that game. Now, we should spend a couple minutes on it. Um, from an offensive perspective, we, we, we got off to a pretty good start. We're moving the ball pretty well. They did a good job of adjusting to us. And throughout the span of the game, we were either pretty effective or they did a good job coming up with decent plays against us. But as an offense, when you're down, especially the way we got down, when we're winning the game and we could have put it away a couple of different times and we didn't, uh, to for them to come from behind the way they did, you got to give them a lot of credit. I take my hat off to Furman. I told their coach that. I've said that to the media and the press. Uh, I take my hat off to them. They could have folded. They didn't. They showed a lot of character. But we're down by three points with 35 seconds to go. The ball's on our own 30-yard line or so. We're able to drive as far as we need to. It's fourth down. There's only 35 seconds left to go on the clock. We only had one timeout. And uh, uh, Alex comes in, and this is his first year starting, so that was only his second game as a starter for us. And to make that kick under pressure, uh, it was good protection. It was a good snap. It was a good hold. I, I was, and I think anybody connected with Coastal should be proud of what the offense did then. Then to go into overtime, and it come through the way they did, especially remember the very beginning, I think it was the first play, second play, we got sacked, and we were still able to come through. I think that was pretty significant. So um, I think by now everybody knows that Big South Player of the Week was Aramis offensively, uh, but we also had Matt Hazel as our Offensive Player of the Week. And I, I was incredibly proud of the way they executed and came through the, the latter part of the game. Uh, from a defensive perspective, when you watch the tape, watch it early on, we're really playing pretty well. And throughout the game, we're really playing pretty well, but then we have a breakdown. Now, we were doing the same thing. We were having those types of breakdowns the week before against a &T. We minimized a lot of those breakdowns. We showed more improvement. And we're hanging in there, and it seems like, okay, this third down play, it's kind of what Clayton, our defensive coordinator, refers to as critical situations in those particular segments of the game. And it's like, it's not third and eight, it's third and game. It's fourth and game. We stop them here, we win the game, it's over, we'll do what we need to do, we take care of business offensively, we're going to be okay. We were erratic on that. And then when we got to the end of the game, the last couple minutes of the game, our defense fell apart. We, we didn't do the job we needed to do. Uh, we weren't making the plays we needed to make. Uh, we had bust in terms of assignment. We had bust in terms of techniques. We had bust in terms of tackles. That carried over then into the overtime. And when you look at it, it was only the last two minutes and the three overtimes, and they didn't even have to run that many plays against us. Um, our defense knows this, and, and we were all disappointed in kind of what happened defensively the latter part of the game. Fortunately, it didn't cost us the game. Our defense knows that. Our defensive staff knows that. I know that. We know that. You know that. Uh, Eastern Kentucky knows that. Furman knows that. We've got to be able to fix some of those things. Um, so when you look at the defense playing throughout the span of the game and don't count the last two minutes, you kind of come away with, we went through seven quarters and only gave up one touchdown. And there was a lot of good things there. But we can't do what we did the last two minutes of the game, obviously, and, and expect, expect to, to, to be able to compete at the national level. Um, our defensive, uh, this, the uh, Big South Player of the Week was Quinn Backus. Uh, our Player of the Week internally was, uh, was Johnny Hartsfeld. Uh, from a special teams perspective, we said this last spring, we said it in preseason, and we're saying it now that, you know, you're never, with what we've got now in terms of talent, et cetera, we've got to be able to win the special teams. We've got to be sound there. And if we're going to compete nationally, we've got to be outstanding there. Uh, I'm not going as far as saying we are outstanding in special teams. I'm not saying that at all. But we clearly won the special team battle. Uh, if you think about just some of the things we did in terms of, let's say, punt, we did a better job of coverage. Uh, we did a better job. They had muffed one. We were able to recover that. That was clearly a big play. Uh, we did a good job with Nicolo Deep being able to both catch the ball when he needed to. He, he doesn't make that catch, and he lets it go. You know, they're going to down the ball on the five or so. He makes the catch. We get the ball in the 17, 18, 19. The other time is the ball's coming down. They got a lot of people there. He fakes a fair catch. He works away from the ball. The ball winds up going in the end zone. We get the ball in the 20 instead of getting it what would have been the five, six, seven. Um, we block an extra point. We don't block the extra point. We lose the game. We intercept. We intercept on their two-point conversion. Now, an interception is one thing, but to get it the whole 100 yards is something else. Now, 
the types of areas that we are starting to show improvement on that I feel good about, Philip George makes a great block, a great block on that return. He doesn't make that block, uh, Mike doesn't go the 100 yards for the two points. There were four or five other guys that had opportunities to throw blocks, but they didn't have the right angle. I'd say three or four weeks ago, they would have thrown the block, we wouldn't have scored, they would have brought the ball back, we would have stopped the two-point conversion, but we don't get the two points, we don't get the two points, we lose that game. So, so, so from a special teams perspective, uh, and I didn't even get to catching yet, but from a special teams perspective, the team as a whole really did, we won the special teams. Um, uh, and Alex, uh, you know, certainly we were all proud of what Alex did. He was our player of the week, he was Big South player of the week. Uh, the kick that he had to make, the 47 yarder, with no time left on the clock, for a guy starting his second game at the college level, was a pretty solid clutch kick. Uh, making the extra points, there wasn't any question about those. Uh, so we won the special teams game. And uh, so that would be pretty much, I think, kind of a summation in terms of what took place on last week's game against Furman. It was a great victory for us. I want to add one more thing. There is no question that anybody that's part of Coastal Carolina and any coaching staff in the country, you would rather there was a possibility we could have won that game by 10 or 15 points, put the game away in the fourth quarter. Now that's what we all know we'd rather do. We would rather have that type of win. But that's not what happened. In hindsight, in hindsight, and this is, and I'm, I'm, I'm never going to be a Monday morning quarterback, but in hindsight, in hindsight, it, for the team to hang in there after giving up the lead, for the team to be able to come back in 35 seconds and tie the game. For the team to come through in triple overtime. Uh, and we know what our mistakes were. We knew it wasn't a perfect game by any stretch of the imagination. Was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful victory for Coastal Carolina. And it gave us just a good sense. Now we know we made mistakes, we know that. And those mistakes are things that we can kind of get better on. Are we going to have them already, already I think, for Eastern Kentucky? I'm not sure we're going to have everything fixed by Eastern Kentucky. But these are things we're going to get better at over time. But what we're hopeful on, and I think our guys feel this, and I think our staff feels this, is that maybe the way we won that game really, really helps us down the road someplace. We knew we hung in there. We knew we were coming back. We knew we did it. We did it. We knew we made some mistakes, but we did it. And there are not many players or coaches in 20 years of coaching football, that's the first overtime game I've ever been part of. Um, to be able to win like that in overtime, maybe that does us more good down the road. And maybe it was fortuitous that it actually went into overtime and we won it that way. Now, we wouldn't be saying that if we lost the game. But so maybe that was ac actually a blessing in disguise. And I know everybody says, well, wouldn't you rather win the other way? And the answer is yes. But in hindsight, Maybe that does Coastal more good and our team more good over time than, than, than would have been the case if we just won the game comfortably in the fourth quarter. All right, before we go on Eastern Kentucky, do you have any questions about Coastal Carolina? Ah, I'm sorry, about uh, Furman. Eastern Kentucky. Questions? Yeah, your thoughts. Just some general thoughts on them as you've uh, done the breakdowns in the different rooms, offensively, defensively. <laughs> I asked Mike, do you want me to just give him thoughts? He's going to touch. He says, no, 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 don't do that. Wait for them to ask questions. So you ask me my <laughs> thoughts. OK. Um, Eastern Kentucky, I, I don't think there's anybody on the staff that, that would disagree with this. I think we're unanimous in the perspective that Eastern Kentucky is a better football team and has better talent than either A&T or Furman. Uh, from an offensive perspective, they, they have a great running attack, and when you have a great running attack, your play action off that becomes incredibly effective. So Denham is their, their key running back, but they've got two other guys behind him that they all average like five, six yards a carry. They gave this kid the ball a lot last year, and he averaged, last season, he averaged over six yards a carry, and he carried the ball a gazillion times. He gained like 1,500 yards, but he averaged over six yards a carry. Then they got two guys behind him that are pretty good football players. Their quarterback prior last year threw 18 touchdowns and had eight interceptions, but part of the reason why he's so effective is because they're doing the play action stuff. If you got him like third and 10, it's a little bit of a different story. He can run. 
and he'll run once in a while, but he's looking to throw and off a of play action. They usually find that you got to cheat a little bit to, in effect, stop the running game. It's a power running game. They'll cross block. They, 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 they'll, they'll load up. Uh, they'll, they'll, get, they'll give you two to three backs to one side. They'll give you kind of a double wing set. Uh, they give you a lot of power looks offensively, and they can do a lot of things out of that. Um, they have a really good receiver in this kid, Bailey, who's, who's done a good job for them. He's also, I think, by a two to three to one, two or three to one ratio, the leading receiver this year as well. They can go to other guys, but he seems to be the go, their go-to guy. If we don't stop, uh, in order to win this game, we've got to be able to stop the running game. But the key to that is staying disciplined so when they go play action, the guys that are responsible for pass first are truly not looking in the backfield. They're reading their keys, and their keys are telling them what to do as opposed to here comes another run that we've got to come up and stop. If we stay disciplined on that, I think we're going to be okay, and we clearly cannot be having the breakdowns that we had last week. Again, that's not going to get fixed overnight. I'm hoping there's a significant improvement. That's not going to get fixed in one game. Uh, we talked, you know, in the spring and we talked in preseason. You got a brand new staff. You got new players working with us, et cetera. Everything is new. Everything is new. Part of that is understanding your players. Like, how do they learn? Uh, what are they good at? Uh, what do they have a little difficulty with? What can you ask them to do that they can really do as opposed to you asking them to do something they really can't do? It takes a little while to be able to learn that. It takes a little time. That's part of what we're going. We're going through growing pains as a staff and as a team. Um, from a defensive perspective, um, they are big and physical up front. They've got very athletic guys up front. Uh, I thought the defensive ends of Furman were really very good. We think these guys are better than they are. Uh, we think their, their linebackers are solid. They move to the ball well. The secondary is solid. They move to the ball well. They've got, um, they've got these two kids, number five and number four that are really great athletes. They're big kids. They're strong kids. They make plays. You see them in all the statistics, et cetera. Um, what we've got to be able to do is put them in a little bit of a bind where they hesitate in terms of run pass reads and they're not sure which way to go. If they know where they got to go right away, they're going to be difficult to be able to contend with. If we can force, uh, cause them to kind of pause a little bit, that, that, that'll give us a little bit of an advantage to make that a little bit more of an equalizer. From a special teams perspective, these guys do more things than any other football team I have seen in the pros, in college, in high school, in the Arena League, in the United Football League, ever in my life. They do a lot of things. They do them well. Now, they know what they're going to do, and they don't come into every game able to do 10 or 12, 15 different things. So their execution is pretty good because they've got two or three things that they want to do in each game. But because they have done all these things, they force you to prepare for that. So, so that, that takes a little extra time. We actually have to devote a little bit more time this week to special team meetings and a little bit more time to special team practices so we at least we have a decent understanding in terms of what they're trying to do. Um, uh, their field goal kicker has the ability to kick a long one. He's also a little insistent he can miss a short one. Uh, but he, he's a little guy, but he, he's got a pretty strong leg. He averages 60 yards and 59 something on kickoffs. And, uh, um, you know, that's about, that may be a little better than what Alex averages. And he only weighs like about 150 pounds. He's just a little inconsistent on his field goals. Um, so I think that's it as far as the special, special teams go. Um, I know they're supposed to have a tradition. I know all, all that stuff. And those things are great, and they help you in recruiting. And there's something you're proud of as part of your legacy and alumnus, et cetera. But they don't have any impact on what happens the following week. So we know we've got to take care of business. I think we understand what we've got to do. This is going to be a real challenge. It's going to be a tough game. Um, but hopefully we are a better team this week than we have been so far. One of your goals uh, coming in here is to make your uh, Coastal Carolina a national power. You're taking on a ranked team, number 20. Uh, just kind of talk about taking on you know, a ranked team and how this could you know, essentially put you guys on the map in the rankings, et cetera. Uh, the Jeff, honest to God, and you know, I saw you had Matt back there and a couple of the guys. You can ask anybody, you grab them anytime. That is not, now everybody knows what our goals ultimately are, but it doesn't matter. And those, these guys could be the best team in the country, they could be the worst team in the country. We've got to get ready this week. We really have to. And there are a lot of things that we've got to fix from last week. So the thought of national rankings, the thought of where they rank, we can't do anything about that. And too often coaches spend too much time talking about all that stuff. It doesn't matter what they're ranked. It's irrelevant. They are pretty good. We need to understand where they are. If they have the exact same talent doing what they're doing and they're ranked 80th, 
It doesn't much matter. We see what they do. They're pretty effective at it. That's what we got to prepare for. So the thought of what may happen after this game, all we care about is this game. Really, literally, it's all we care about. It's not more important that they're ranked and you guys we have nothing to do with it. So, it, so th what the way I think that through is, is what kind of impact does that have in our thoughts and our preparation? If we spend 10 minutes on the fact that they're ranked, that's 10 minutes that comes away from our preparation. That's a bad use of our, that's a bad allocation of our time. It doesn't come up, it hasn't come up once. It hasn't come up once in anything that we do. Now, I think everybody knows that, but there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, literally nothing we can do about it. We talked about it with the kids here. Talk a little bit about having a home field advantage and kind of the atmosphere around the campus and expecting that to help you out. I tell you what I was, yeah, that helps. I think that certainly helps. I, I can't tell you, um, and I said this after our first game, and we actually went actually through Chad, we actually went and we thanked our student body. The students that came to opening day that were here in the end zone could not have been more enthusiastic, more excited, more engaged the entire game. They were phenomenal. Now, it wasn't like there was 50,000 of them, but the guys or the students, the, 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 the men and the women that were here that are a part of the student body here could not have been better. I don't care where you are in Nebraska, Notre Dame, I don't care. That group was as enthusiastic as the same size group anywhere in the country. They were phenomenal. Uh, at Hunter's meeting the other day, we were told that you know there's only about 800 seats or so left. Uh, you know, and, and I know, so we'll have a nice crowd. I know all those things will be good. But the energy that the students have, because we represent the students, we represent everybody in the stands. And the fact that they, they were so enthusiastic, that always kind of makes you feel good. Now, does that make a difference? I want to say it makes a little bit of a difference. Yeah, you appreciate the support. You appreciate you got people behind you. You don't want to let you don't want to let them down. By the same token, it doesn't affect our preparation or anything else we do. But I think it's great that we're playing at home, and if they continue to show the enthusiasm, I was incredibly proud of the student body that showed up. I hope more of them show up, and if they show the same type of enthusiasm that they showed the first week, you know, we can't be we're we're incredibly grateful for that. I know you touched on it a little bit, and this is probably nitpicking the win you guys just had, but the defensive breakdowns at the end of the game uh, to allow them to score pretty much as their last five possessions, um, is that concerning to you? You know, I touched on it. I talked about it, I thought, for like 45 minutes almost. The, yeah, that's concerning to me. I want to take a, I want to slam my head with a shovel like 15 times because of what happened. That was. Let me be clear on this. That was a horrible breakdown. We broke down, we missed tackles, we lost our leverage, we screwed up on assignments. That was bad, it was horrible, that was concerning. We spent a lot of time looking at that, a lot of time talking about it. Yes, that was concerning to me. Now, it's also concerning to our guys, but they know that. Now, having said that, that's the same defense that gave up one touchdown in seven quarters. So the defense understands that. In fact, I met yesterday along with the defense, and they're aware of that. No, they feel they feel bad. Now they feel, thank God. I think they literally said, thank God we won that game. But they understand what they did. Now, I'm not sure we can fix all that against a good opponent in one week. Uh, but those things, you, know, you can't, you, you'll never compete at the national level if you have those types of breakdowns. Coach, can you talk a little bit about um Miles Rankin and just the decision to allow him to rejoin the team and, and maybe what roles you envision for him uh, moving forward? Yeah, Miles. Um Miles had been asked to leave the team. He had been, he had been suspended. Uh, he had done a good job. He, he did everything that he was supposed to do. Um, uh, he had asked if he'd come back on the team. He thought that he merited that. So we let him come back on the team. He's still ineligible, I believe, for one more game. And uh, I think because he's ineligible, we haven't been giving him much work with the first to the second unit. So he's been playing scout teams, working hard, he's doing a good job in the classroom, and when he is eligible to go, probably the first area where we start, where he might be able to help us be special teams. And, you know, he started last year, so, uh, so, so there's, or he played a lot last year. So I think he can provide us some, some depth in the secondary probably right away, but we're not focused too much on that because he still has another game left. How's your running back situation? I know uh, Jeremy had you know, most of the carries, but this past week you had a little two running back system, which you, I guess you said first time that you weren't going to do. No, I didn't. I said we're not going to be running back guy by committee. So, so we've got we had two guys. I mean, two of them had two of them had an opportunity to run the ball 
a reasonable amount of time. Um, uh, and then we kind of use Zach in there as sort of the third guy. Lorenzo got the ball a reasonable amount. Uh, uh, Jeremy got the ball a reasonable amount. I said we're not going to do it by committee. There are many times we want two running backs in the game. That's part of our package. That's different from like we can't decide what we want to do with our running backs. We know exactly what we want to do with our running backs. Uh, and we have also said, because you were the guy that asked me the same question, was like, how about the balance? What do you want to do? You want to run? You want to pass? It's no. It, the the diff defense is going to dictate to us kind of, you know, where do we think we kind of take advantage of that? We were more effective with the run against A and T. That helped our passing game. We were effective early in the game with the two running backs, uh, moving the ball pretty well against uh, against Furman, and they had they had to make some adjustments to do a decent job taking that away. Those adjustments is what gave us the passing game later on in the game. Okay, so so if, if we're moving the ball effectively and you're allowing us to do that, and we think we've got a competitive advantage there, if we've got to run the ball 75 times, we'll run the ball 75 times, but we'll do that out of one back and two back sets. So two guys is part of our part of one of the packages, just a two-back package versus a one-back package. Is that fair? Yes, sir. And I didn't say we're only going to use one running back. I said we're not going to so do it by the committee. One, if it's a one-back package, it's not going to be. If it's a one-back package, it's normally going to be one guy, unless we think there's another reason. A lot depends. If you think there's one guy that's a little better at doing something than somebody else, you put him in the game. Not because we're not sure who we're going to play next. When you break down the game tape, did you look more at the Moorhead game or the Purdue game? Look at them both. I think the one that, um, because Purdue was so dominant, uh, they, they're still doing similar things. I think if I'm a coach, it's natural, just forget as a coach, as a human being, you automatically kind of gravitate toward or go back to things that you were successful with, things that felt good. So there were more things for them that felt good in the Moorhead game. So when we look at tendencies, I think it's a mistake to look at Purdue. We should focus on Moorhead. But we look at what they did in both games. We need to be able to do that. We look at tendencies. We look a little bit more at the Moorhead game. We got to look at them both. You talked about the uh, special teams last week being a key victory for you. <clears throat> With their unorthodox punting game uh, this coming week, how do you feel it will affect Niccolo in the blocking game? The blo you mean blocking kicks or Niccolo, Niccolo protection for him? It's, it creates headaches. It creates problems. So you can approach that a couple of different ways. You can have multiple answers for multiple things. The problem with that is, the problem with that is, you're going to have difficulty executing multiple answers. Or you can have a couple of answers that you can execute that are sound against the different things that they do. So we're still in the process. We experimented a little bit on Sunday. We got a number of things. We're playing around with the game plan. We experimented a little bit yesterday. Based on yesterday's practice, we're kind of starting to focus on things today. We're going to make final decisions on that t uh, tonight. I'm a little slow here. What? You? No. Come on. Come on. What makes them so unorthodox on the punt game? Have you, have you seen them? Oh, okay, no, okay, we'll just, well, no, you'd see it right away if you'd seen them on tape. They do, they have spread punts. They have three guys, just let's keep it simple. They'll have a punter and three guys in a shield. Then a different, they'll have two guys in protection. Then they'll have one guy in protection. Then they'll have three guys here and motion one out, now leaving them two. They'll have, begin with one and motion a guy back. They'll take the three guys and shift. That's just those three guys. Then they'll do things with the front where they'll be tight, they'll be wide, they'll isolate guys, et cetera. So they have a traditional punt. They've got like a rugby punt. They've got different combinations of those. They, they're not afraid to show a fake. They've done that. Um, so, I mean, they probably, I mean, in two games, we probably have at least 12 different looks in terms of what they're doing punt. In two games, you, so they're going to prepare against one look from us. They've got like 12 looks. This is probably one of the most thrilling games Coach has ever been a part of. Um, yeah, man, it was a lot. It was very thrilling. Uh, both teams played hard. You know, both teams had a lot of character. But, uh, you know, we just we just pulled it out. I say it was a great college experience. You know, we, um, we all practice hard, and, you know, Coach does a great job of putting us in tough situations. So, you know, we faced it with situations like that in the game. We were able to, you know, keep our composure and, you know, do what we were coached to do, be able to perform under pressure. When you look back at it, you know, obviously you would have rather just won in regulation and for it to be over with. But, you know, now that you know that you won in three overtimes in the way that you did, do you think you guys can now, uh, that makes you better being able to, you know, face that adversity and come out on top of it? 
Uh, I think it does. I mean, just you know, just putting, just being in that situation um, during practice in the week, so it makes it a lot easier. And it makes us a lot uh, more focused to perform at that type of environment. Yes, sir. It's, mm, like I said, it's just, it's just a great, great experience, and you know, usually. You know, people people would get down on stuff like that, but you know we did a great job of just maintaining and you know c continue playing hard. You know, doing what we we're coached to do. You know, not just giving up, giving it all that we had at the moment. Hey Matt, uh, you guys have started two and zero in the past before. Uh, how how does this team deal with success, knowing you guys do have some tough tough opponents here coming up? Uh, we know we have to come to work every day. Uh, we have to prepare for uh, our opponent weekly. You know, we don't look at it as two and no. We go by zero and zero every week. So we have to win, be one and one and no every week. But uh, we just do a good job of preparing. The coaches do a good job of breaking down our opponents. So it makes it a lot easier for us to just you know go out and play. It's been an encouraging start though, Nate, for the host a ranked team. What kind of opportunity is this to maybe turn some more heads? Uh, for I think it's just a good challenge for us, you know, playing ranked teams, uh, affirming the ANT with good teams. You know, uh, East Kentucky is a good team, so, you know, I mean, we've been in this situation before, so we're looking forward to it. Matt, you mentioned the breakdown. What, what do you see in this Eastern Kentucky team that possibly you can exploit? Um, um, I give away your secrets, are you? Nah. <laughs> nah, just, um, you know, we see a lot of uh, opportunities to work outside, uh, go across the middle. You know, uh, our offensive line does a good job, so we feel like we can run the ball or whatever and uh, explore some of their weaknesses. You know the history middle. behind this team? I mean, I'm sure you've got respect for them, knowing that they're ranked. I mean, they've made the second most playoff appearances than any team in FCS history. Uh, I mean, you just gonna have to take it one game at a time. You know, we look at an opponent. You know, we we all expect to go out there and win. You know, we look at an opponent. You know, how many wins they had, uh, what they did last season, the new season. So you never know. So we just going out there and just giving it our best. What was Furman doing that? You know, were they one on one with you? Is that why you had such a big game? Or? Finding a way to separate, get open. Aramis just throwing great passes. What was up last week? Uh, it's just kudos to uh, Coach Patno, man. He seen, you know, he seen that, you know, I was doing good for uh, regulation or whatever. But he told us, you know, we just big time players make big time plays a big time game. So, you know, he called, uh, he called on the big time players just to make plays. When, um, you know, going into this week. If you look at the end of that last game, I guess technically the defense allowed them to score like the last five possessions, was it? Um, what, does that give you guys some extra motivation even coming off a win that you know you guys were struggling a little bit in there defensively at the end of the game? Yes, sir. It's, it was um, you know, well fought game and you know, sometimes um Furman to catch us, you know, doing things we didn't have any business so our offense to, you know, take over for us and it, it's you know, three phases of the game. So, you know, we did well at offense, special teams, and defense. But this week we were practicing harder, you know, focusing more on our fundamentals and techniques and doing the right thing to make us, you know, so we won't have a, a lapse like last game. So it wasn't a matter of being gassed. The old defense wasn't like. No, sir. It's, no, sir. It was just, you know, we just need to do, you know, what our coaches coach us to do, rather than trying to do things on our own. You know, staying, staying coachable and focus on everything that we have to do. After that first win, Quinn, you know, you saw a lot of the community you know, get pumped up about Coastal Carolina football. Then, after a second win, what's it been like now? And you heard Mike, you know, a lot of tickets have been sold. You know, what, what's it, what's it like around campus here? Uh, it's, it's a nice deal. You know, everybody seems like everybody's excited, you know, about the football program and more, you know, um, when it's the next game, what time is, want to be more involved. So, I mean, that's a positive thing. It kind of <coughs> adds energy to, you know, the team and not only to the team, but to the community and just make everybody, you know, to put Coastal Carolina above, you know, 
help us rise and continue to just play hard, make you want to play hard for the university and just give it all. Looks like they have a pretty good running back. Is that kind of the game plan for Eastern Kentucky or what do you think? Yes, sir. They do a lot of, um, you know, inside running and, you know, so it, we'll just have to be disciplined and focus on our our job and do what we're supposed to do. Well, what type of offense do they run? What concerns you? The uh, what I'm not sure. It's you look on film. It's all kind of different formations, but the main thing we just have to play our football and you know buy into what our coach is telling us and just go out and execute. Matt, if you could just talk a little about the connection you and Aramis have. I know you guys, uh, did you grow up near each other? Uh, do, you, do you guys have a pretty good connection on the field and off of it? Um, yeah, we got a pretty good, we got actually a good relationship. Um, you know, it's just uh, working hard over the offseason, you know, getting extra reps, uh, just getting the timing down. So I think that just makes it a lot better, a lot easier for us on the field.